25-ish. Um, yes, I was. And uh, for start of business is public comment. And please introduce yourself. Um, and remember there's a camera as well. This is um, You're not going to hear it, Kiana, because okay. it's to the microphone. It's to okay. The microphone. <laughs> I was like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Kiana Bromley, and I'm the Montclair High School Drama Director. I've also directed the Main Street Middle School Crafters Edge 8th grade productions for the past two years, and I just finished the Main Street Middle School 5th through 8th grade musical. I'm also on the auditorium renovation teams for both the high school and the upcoming UES renovation. But during the school hours, I am a flexible pathways teacher for Montclair High School. Additionally, I'm here today as a Montclair resident and the mother of two upcoming school-aged children. And I'm here specifically today to ask the board to seriously consider how our district can more formally support theater arts education in our schools. Over the past four years as the Montclair High School Drama Director, I've experienced a significant increase in students who seek me out to engage further in theater. They want to deepen their learning experience, get involved for the first time, or use their skills to contribute to a production. I'm constantly finding myself in a position where students want to engage more and they need educational support. Um, in short, they need me to design the learning experience to fit their needs. And this experience is exhilarating um, and inspiring to me as an educator, but it requires my expertise and a lot of well-spent time. For this reason, I feel it is important for me to share today and advocate the, for the work I've already started, but need financial and structural support to continue providing. My goal tonight is to, as quickly as I can, quickly highlight um, why this conversation is important, timely, and needed, and why it should not be overlooked as a part of the FY21 budgeting process. The added value and potential impact of this work will have important results that positively impact our schools. My first point is that theater arts as a curriculum is, the, is a missing pillar in our district's arts education. Theater arts is an important industry in our society, both as live theater and connected with film and television. The study of theater arts is rich in technical and transferable skills and is easily connected with, with very relevant project-based learning by connecting production programming with curriculum work. Productions are a cornerstone, are cornerstone of um, a theater arts program, which are expanded with educational coursework. The complex deadline-based productions are host to many student-driven opportunities to plan, problem solve, and create with their peers. The nature of a production team and ensemble requires students to work together and develop a sense of community around shared goals. Working on a team requires uh, communication, and telling stories require understanding and interpretation. I can go on and on about the relevance of theater opportunities to learning and how engaging the process can be. Secondly, I'd like to talk about community. We in Montpelier and Roxbury believe strongly in community connections, and theater provides a tremendous opportunity co to connect with the school community, where students work together on something that's created using our students' talents. Students share a sense of pride and ownership for the finished performance. There's a sense of family and community that comes from being involved in creating something unique. With strong theater arts programming, the school community and culture are positively impacted and students learn an appreciation for the arts. And with that appreciation comes a more tolerant and supportive culture. One district phrase that sticks out to me um, is all means all. I can't think of a better way to work towards this goal than exploring theater arts as an option. Theater, whether it's live or filmed, is society's mechanism for examining the human experience. It explores relationships and humanity as its content and provides the opportunity to discuss and react. The process of putting together a production requires the work of a diverse set of people, from talented performers to tech wizards to builders and painters and cosmetic artists. They all work together to accomplish a common goal. This process requires there to be diversity. It requires acceptance, appreciation, and the ability to trust many people as a part of the team. The theater is a tremendous place for people of all identities to find a home and a space to contribute and learn important skills. All, mean, all means all uh, means having diversity in our opportunities and diversity in our arts offerings, providing diversity in the ways that students can express themselves and their learning. One thing that our current budget is trying to address is the need for additional social emotional support. Theater is an incredible setting for social emotional work and therapy. Role play work, character work, and working on the self is a huge component of theater in addition to the plethora of opportunities to do hands-on projects and make meaningful contributions. 
I would like the district and staff to consider recognizing the potential use of theater arts as a strategic place to incorporate opportunities and experiences geared, geared towards supporting students with significant social emotional needs. These opportunities would be on campus, connecting with a school community, and work with peers in a positive and purposeful way. Last but not least, I must address human capital, which is me in this scenario. Um, a large part of my request today and for the past six months is to bring recognition to the work I do as an educator and to recognize the work as being the work of a theater arts educator and not just a co-curricular. Um, I'm a licensed educator that applies my knowledge of curriculum and student learning to the design of my theater arts program. And this work that I've done over the past four years has grown, grown the program and um, inspired, inspired more students to engage with this work in meaningful ways. In a recognized theater arts educator position, my work would be more appropriately valued and I would be given more time to align the strategic opportunities within the district with the needs of our students. Um, I have taught in many settings, but I am most inspired by the teaching I do within the theater. I believe in the work and I see its impact every day on the students and on the community. The work I've done within the Montpelier schools has taught me that there is a real need for a dedicated, experienced point person for the theater in the district. Teachers and students in all of the Montpelier Town Schools um, have sought my help in the past couple of years, and I'd like to formally help them, um, as well as the Roxbury Village School with their programming dreams, um, all in support of our very diverse and deeply wonderful students. As a community member, I continue to give my time, energy, and passion, passion for a growing theater in this community because I really want this community to have a strong theater program for my children. My daughter starts in kindergarten next year, um, and she's very interested in theater already, and I want her and her peers to have consistent theater opportunities as an option right next to athletic, music, and other academic opportunities, creating a more equal culture and social scene relating to interests and talents. My hope for the district is to have um, strategic and appropriate theater arts programming from K to 12 and for flexible and for a flexible pathways 9 through 12 to connect the extensive amount of work done by our students to specific theater arts proficiency standards. Supporting more theater arts in this district with a licensed theater arts educator doing this strategic work will support in students having a stronger sense of school pride, self-confidence, and belonging that will have positive impacts on our school culture and behavior. My ask of the board and the budget is as follows. A point to theater arts flexible pathways teacher position at MHS, which provides the opportunity for students to complete those personalized learning studies in theater arts, and a point for theater arts program director uh, position, which would absorb the co-curricular role to recognize the significant, uh, significant amount of teaching and curriculum-based planning and design that goes into running a theater program and using the productions as strategic learning environments for all students. Um, thank you very much for your time and commitment to this school district and our students, um, and I'd love to engage more in this conversation. Um, and I do have with me, um, since my speech was so long, and I'm very sorry, um, I do have that speech written out as well as I had a, multiple parents and students that couldn't make it tonight that I've been collecting evidence from, and they have provided written copies of those for all of you. Great, thank you. Just, yeah, pass it to you. You can pass it down. So, thank you. Yeah, that was that was excellent. Thank you. Um, I do see a fair amount of people. Um, that was yeah, exactly. That's restorative justice. I know. So I just want to be kind of mindful. Um, I think a lot of them are with me. Yeah, the soup's available. I just want to see if there's a lot of other people who want to talk. And um, so raise your hand if you want to speak. I wrote something up so I could just share it with you. Okay, you can share. My other thing is, if, if you're speaking on the same subject, I think she gave us a lot of information. Yes. Uh, if you just want to say me too, please try to make it short and just, you know, try not to be repetitive because we do want to move things along. But please speak. We usually um, try to keep the whole thing to five minutes and it's already been over. No, that's totally good. I just want to, um, I want people to speak, but just be being mindful of time. Um, you know, we've got a lot of great information here, so if there's anything additive, uh, you know, try to keep your comments to things that are additive, but feel free to say, I fully support this, thank you, if that's kind of the gist of, of your comment. So go ahead. Okay. Um, my name is Marnie Lakin, and I'm a resident here in Montpelier, um, and I fully support um, Kiana's proposal. Um, but in addition, I would like to add 
Um, uh, the middle school um, drama club um, is also completely not funded. Um, even after a year, more than a year now, but after a year of success, the idea was that they would be funded in, this, in the current year that we're in, and that never happened. Um, and it, instead, so it, or in, in spite of, uh, the production that just happened last week was phenomenal. Um, but all of the adults were volunteers. And there were 42, I think, um, students involved. That was four days a week after school from, for the entire semester, you know, until last weekend, um, plus evenings. Um, and yet, how does that compare to coaching? How does that compare to the sports programs? And how many students are really involved? And I think that it's time for the Montpelier um, Roxbury School District to really step up and acknowledge what kids want to do and where they're spending their time and how they're spending their time. I mean, I'm an arts educator as well, so I could go on and on um, as Canada did on the, for the benefits, but I really just think you need to look at the, the numbers and look at what the kids are doing um, and make it equitable um, uh, no, matter, you know, no matter what the kids want to do. So. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Others? Good evening, my name is James Nagel, and I'm the father of June Nagel, who is a senior now at Mount Gilder High School. And, but for the theater arts and the uh, choral programming here, um, she would not be the person that she is today. And the fact that Kiana has worked specifically with Juna, but also with all the other mask club folks, and has really I've watched them from the time they were fifth grade on. Um, it's been remarkable. And I just want to say that this is something you should be supporting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Ella Darcy. I'm quite a pleasure to be um, students here yeah, yeah. for speaking for Kiana. Um, the Mask Theater program has taught us so much. Just over the past year, theater has drastically improved our comprehension skills, social abilities, public speaking, self-confidence, and our overall happiness. Without theater, we know we would not be as strong of, a, of learners as we are today. Theater keeps us more engaged and interested than most of our core classes. We really wish it was possible for us to get an art credit from theater, especially since it is a combination of all the arts the school offers, plus a few it doesn't. Kiana has made the transition to MHS so much easier as she has welcomed us and made us feel like we are part of a community. She makes every show special and unique. Just imagine what she could do if she could fully commit to theater. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. If I read, it'll go quicker, so don't fear the paper. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm Joe Carroll, I'm a Montpelier resident and a teacher here at the high school, and I'm emphatically supporting the proposal that Kiana mentioned. Uh, as you probably know, the high school unit design template, and I hope that's my ad here, I do appreciate the fact that we're all here in support, but my ad is about like the actual unit template that we use to design uh, instruction here, and it's based on this book called Understanding by Design by Grant Wiggins and Jay McTighe. And at the top of it, uh, it highlights as most important what we call the enduring understanding, or in Montpelier High School language, learning expectations. These are the transferable skills that rise above any one particular subject's content area. And uh, for folks who don't speak teacher language, what that means is that students retain not specific pieces of content, but deep learning based on understanding how that learning applies across and within other disciplines and all aspects of life. And that's what I mean when I say transfer or transferable skill. And as someone who teaches a subject about which folks often ask, why would somebody learn that? I relate to, understand, and completely agree with Deanna's emphasis on transferable skills. In a certain sense, the question is no longer why would somebody learn something, but instead, why, what is the transfer and learning potential from that course of study? The potential amount of content information is so vast that the what is no longer as important as the how and the why. Sure, it may appear at face value that math, science, English, and social studies, and other required courses are, are um, sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> I said I would read them real quick, I'm sorry. 
um, uh, like those subjects would be the must knows, uh, but in reality, the unit design of our school essentially rejects a hierarchy of content and instead emphasizes deep learning no matter what the course. Put another way, making kids self-aware, purpose-driven, and in a sense, whole. In the 21st century, knowledge of discrete content information is nowhere near as important as the ability to know how to learn, and as the ancients said, know thyself. Theater under Kiana's expert care and management does that to a huge extent for the kids involved in it and could potentially do that for many more kids whom the current system and its current structure cannot serve. Kiana is proposing to expand that access and I say we support her to that end. All of this is to say, among other reasons, as a resident and as an educator, I endorse wholeheartedly Kiana's theater or arts proposal. To me, the question isn't really should we do this, but why would we not give this demonstrably powerful learning experience more support? And why would we not further empower this highly effective educator to continue her excellent work? The learning potential is enormous, and we owe it to our community and our kids to further develop this program. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I just want to add yeah, go for it. <laughs> yes. I'm not going to read everything. I just want to read the last paragraph. So my name is Melanie Taylor. I'm a parent. I'm the mom of Eve here, she's one of the leader program. Um, <laughs> so I just want to read about for the, the students that have commitments that don't have the chance. So um, having a class for theater arts within school will provide students with commitments after school and a, an opportunity to experience the benefits and positive aspects of theater. Uh, currently, students do not have an opportunity, opportunity I mean, to gain credit for the hard work they put into the theater program after school. Having a class would allow students to pursue what they love in school while being exposed to the academic aspect of the other. So it'd be nice that we become part of the curriculum as a class. Okay. Yep. Molly. <laughs> I'm Molly Clark. I'm the choral director here at the high school and at the middle school. I work very closely with Kiana. Um, and I just want to make it known that I am I'm in full support of everything I will not go in, because I too could ramble on and on and on and on about um, arts opportunities. But I do think that we are currently not serving our students to our fullest potential by um, our current arts offerings. I think the, the lack of diversity that we have right now is not, um, doesn't align with our values as a, as a school and a district. Um, so I think that we as, as a community can be giving more for our students in terms of arts. Great, thank you. Pauline? <laughs> I'm Melody Meyer, and I have two daughters at Main Street Middle School in the fifth and the seventh grade. They were heavily involved in the spam a lot um, this season, and it was a, what I believe it, it to be, a, it was a life-changing experience for them. I'm going to read you just a snippet but because um, I feel so passionately about a couple of the bullet points that I put down yeah. here. After being involved in extracurricular produ productions in different capacities for the past two years, our children have grown in both confidence and enthusiasm. Being involved in theatrical productions has taught them to work with others in an ensemble, help them to build their social skills, develop new friendships, and has encouraged them to take positive chances on themselves by opening up to the vulnerability and possibility that comes with auditioning for a role. Um, I hope you'll consider inclusion of support for the theater program in the district going forward. My children will enthusiastically participate and I believe that this is a great opportunity for healthy self-expression and social and emotional development. Thank Fantastic. You. Thanks. Hi, I'm Mark Laxer. I moved recently to Montpelier. Um, my son is in the middle school. My daughter is in the high school. Uh, there are several reasons why we chose to move to Montpelier, but a critical part of that was based on discussions before we moved here with Kiana. Um, I concur with all that has thus far been spoken. Um, Kiana is dynamic. She's on fire. Let's go. I'm Sam, I'm over here. Yeah. Not currently ignited. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, Sam is on fire too. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was a very theater obsessed kid.
kid, and there weren't many oppor there weren't any opportunities really for plays or musicals in the elementary school or in the in the middle school until eighth grade. So I was always like traveling out, out of out of town, like like to, to, like schlep myself to Brooklyn on the bus and stuff, like uh, on some school nights, uh, at, just just so, so so I could like maintain my. Uh, uh, Excitedness, for, yeah, happy, <laughs> not, but yeah. Uh, but once I got to eighth grade, I was, I was really excited, and then Kiana made that in incredible. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in those movies; it was really fun. Um, and Madagascar. Yeah, it was, it was really cool. Um, and but I, 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 I really wished during my middle school years, leading up to that, that there was like a, a whole school play or something. And I'm really happy for the middle schoolers now that they have that, and Kiana has implemented that and brought that there because the, yeah, the, that, that, that was something I, I really wish was part of my experience, so I think that's really cool. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I agree with everything that everybody said. My name is Julie, and I have a son who's a sophomore. Um, I think that the only thing I will add is that my child was a confirm, confirmed introvert, comes home and couldn't be more excited when there's a play. Um, and I thank you so much for that. But he, um, it, it gives him an opportunity to take risks that he might not, not otherwise take. Like he sat out a musical, wishing he could be part of it, but didn't really dare to last year. And this year he, he went out for it. And I, I don't think he ever would have done it if it weren't for um, <coughs> Kiana's dynamic approach to theater and the amount of excitement that she brings to it, but also also um, discipline. I think that, that, that my kid is definitely learning a lot from having this opportunity, and I hope that it goes forward. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So, anyone else? Great, well thank you everyone. Uh, we really, I, I love it when people come out passionately on an issue like this. And I've also, I could not see spam a lot this weekend, but um, I heard everyone raving about it. So, um, you know, the contribution of theater to our education is definitely valued by the community and valued by the students. So thank you everyone for coming and speaking. Um, and next on our, um, on our agenda, we have a bunch of fantastic students from high school to talk about restorative justice. I'm going to get the consent agenda. Consent agenda. Consent oh, yeah. That we could do that first. I'll move we approve the consent agenda. I'll second. Um, I think Tina wants to take something off. Could, could we pull the superintendent's progress check because we're talking about it later on? Sure. So I think we need to revise the motion. Move that we approve the consent agenda minus the progress check. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Now we have high school students talking about restorative justice. So, so uh, I would like to introduce Lindsay Hellman, who just to put everybody everything out there, she is a good friend of mine. <laughs> Our daughters in second grade, or sorry, third grade together. She's actually at my house this weekend. Uh, <laughs> exactly. So um, Lindsay is here. She works for she works a lot with restorative justice. So when the board asked for training around this, she was the person I called, and she's worked with our fine students here. So she brought a bunch here. So Lindsay, take over. Yeah. <laughs> so this is going to be a collaborative presentation because really the knowledge is right here and the wisdom is right here. And so we'll start with instructions, right? So just like Libby said, my name is Lindsay Hallman. I um, am currently the program director at Up for Learning, moving into the executive director role in January. And I also am the coordinator of the Vermont Restorative Approaches Collaborative, um, which is a group of 40 plus trainers, restore, uh, community justice center folks, educators, who are working with schools across the state with support from the AOE, a contract that we have with the AOE to support schools and moving towards a restorative approach. So, and you'll be learning more about that this evening. Um, I'm Kayla Ellingson, ninth grade. I'm Ella Darcy, ninth grade. I'm Marianne Songhurst, and I'm in 12th grade. I'm Tracy Cesaria, I'm a senior. I'm Micah Blomberg, and I'm also a senior. Hi, good evening. I'm Lisa Noss. I'm one of the school counselors here at the high school. 
And I met Lindsay when I took her course last year. Um, I got interested in restorative practices and learned most of what I know about it through her course. And I'm Allie Kuhlman, she, her. Um, I am the social worker at the Main Street Middle School. Okay, so before we start this presentation, we just want to take a second to recognize that restorative practices has been around for centuries. In fact, we can't take full credit for it. It was actually developed from indigenous, indigenous practices, so we just got to recognize and realize that first. And then, and kind of honor that too. Um, restorative practices is kind of an alternative practice of discipline, and we see it kind of as a transformative and repairing way to like deal with like repairing harm or damage to our school community. Um, the approach is not just to program, um, but we must learn how to naturalize it into our system from foundation up. And it incorporates justice in all forms and positive change into institutions everywhere. And our quote is, restorative justice is a compass, not a map. Okay, so um, when we think about uh, restorative practices, um, we, we tend to say restorative practices when it comes to school communities. Restorative justices oftentimes more referred to when we're talking about community justice, right? So in general, we're going to talk into the umbrella term of restorative practices. Um, it really relies heavily upon um, relational kind of ecology, so how groups of people relate to one another um, within an environment, so in this case, within our school environment. Um, so uh, schools that have a strong relational, relational ecology um, have a primary focus on relationships. And one of the things that we know about education, right, is that um, relationships build a really strong foundation for deep and real learning, um, and experiences that stick with uh, people as they grow through life. Um, the strong trust between students, teachers, administrators, community members is, is a foundational piece of restorative practices. And I, I would venture to say also um, a piece that Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools really values. Um, it offers time and space to be heard, right? So uh, a community that, that values the things that restorative practices values really offers that, um, which is something that I think oftentimes, especially in places like schools where hierarchies are a natural thing that are formed, time and space to be heard for youth is something that we don't um, always see in places like that. Um, the shared power, um, especially allowing students um, the ability and the role in uh, problem solving and change making is incredibly key to this, and you can see that um, you'll see as we continue on that the youth are going to speak a lot more than the adults here, and that's hugely important to us. Um, and then last but certainly not least, I think kind of the overarching um, thing to remember here tonight is that th there's a strong focus on social justice and equity, right? When, when people, especially youth, get what they need, right, we, um, we see them grow and blossom a lot more than, than um, when we prescribe the same thing for every kid. Um, so I'm going to turn the mic over. So when we talk about restorative practices, we want to think about that there are three pillars. And the first pillar is that we are building and maintaining healthy relationships both between students and students and teachers and students. The second one is making sure that we have equitable, equitable learning environments, especially with the curriculum and the environment in the school. And the third one is repairing harm and transforming the conflict. And restorative practices bring together people to understand why conflict occurs and why it should be Okay, so basically going off of that, there's a couple of things that kind of we need for our sort of school to work. So the first being um, that people can develop a sense of belonging. I think that really speaks to the kind of community aspect of restorative practices. If everyone is kind of being engaged in the learning environment and the circles, um, our store of practices will really be a lot more effective. And kind of along with that is the culture that we have to develop where everyone is able to kind of appreciate others and their intrinsic worth. So that's also kind of off of the community thing. I think that everyone needs to be able to um, uh, respect each other for this to the system to really take off. And also there's the part about the interpersonal relationships that 
um, kind of come with this. So to really have a good community for this to work in, you need to have um, a place where people are really able to connect with one another. And that's, um, and that's really important. important. And along with that, um, every, with restorative practices, every student gets to add their voice. So there, I know there are a lot of people who get kind of marginalized in high school. And this is just kind of their opportunity to have everyone on a um, level playing field and everyone can kind of uh, say what they want to say, even if they wouldn't get that opportunity otherwise. So at its core, it's uh, really about the paradigm shift and how we do things in schools. I think in like many of our systems in our society and organizations, things are done to and for people, but in a restorative practice or in a restorative approach, it's done with one another. And shouldn't that be the purpose of school, to be in relationship with one another so that we can be deeply engaged and, um, and successful? So um, this might, I don't know how familiar you all are with the um, multi-tier system of support, MTFS. So when we look at restorative practices and a restorative approach in school, it's, it's like you can put this on top of that. Um, and at the bottom, the foundation of that is the universal supports, what everyone receives in a school community. And without that, that, that strong community, time to build relationships and build that capacity through, and you can see in that box on the side, through a variety of different pieces that are already in place in your school system, or you know, are the focus of many of our systems. If we don't have that foundation, then moving into the next tiers is not gonna be as successful. So taking time to focus on the universal tier one support is essential, and it really gets at the width of the sort of practices. I heard mention earlier social emotional learning, and I know that's focused um, and, um, for your district. And so that's, that's one of those pieces. So it's looking at the things that are already in place and recognizing, hey, we're already doing a lot of the restorative practice work. How do we just think about it in a different way? So it's a change of mental models. At the same time in tier one, it's a, there's a different way to respond when, when harm is done within a school system in regards to relationships and, and how um, relationships are repaired um, in, in a restorative approach. So that's, I think we're gonna get into that a little bit further along, but that might be through a different way to think about when something occurs, what are the, what's the language that is used, the restorative language and questions, and how are folks held accountable for their, for their behavior in a way that is, um, that allows them to not be shamed, but um, re-enter into their community in a supportive way. As you move further up, just like you know, in a tier two support, those are like when you have intervention. So this is maybe when there's been harm done. What does that look like in a restorative model? So that might be a restorative circle, a conference, or peer mediation. So instead of, and we'll get to the why later on, but instead of pushing out and removing kids from a, a classroom, it's bringing them back in. Um, and then finally, if there is um, situations where harm is done and, and uh, folks need to take time away from school, how do we welcome them back into a school community and have a process that truly reintegrates them and they understand what supports they have, but they're also held accountable for their actions. So same sort of, um, same structure as the MTSS structure, um, but without that foundational piece of I bet if you went down that list, you could say, check, check, we're doing a lot of that already in our school system. Um, without those pieces and spending more time and focus and energy on those, arts integration could be one of those, um, you're not gonna be able to really think about um, how to resolve conflict in a different way. Um, I uh, was a ninth grader, so last year I was an eighth grader, and I was the oldest grade to take part in the MSMS middle schools um, approach on restorative circles. Last year we um, go back. Oh, um, last year we took part in like community-based groups and our TAs are uh, our, you know 20 minutes in the morning where we talked. And then the idea was to build a community, like a sense of community and each TA was given like a specific format for the circle and 
they didn't take any student input in making those questions or thinking about what maybe we'd like to talk about. And I think that was kind of what ruined it for us. And it would have been a better um, experience if they had taken our input. Um, my TA did later in the year after we started um, came up with their own questions that interested us and that made it a lot more enjoyable and we wanted to participate in it. Yeah, if it was done to us, or if it was done yeah, with us instead of to us, um, as like at having our own questions, being like taking our input, I think it would have done, gone smoother because I remember when I would get done with these Friday circles, I was like just lamenting it because I was we were given these questions that really had no, there was no reason for us to want to care about them. And if we did this correctly, it would um, bring a sense of like caring about everyone and everything around us. So I'll just quickly talk a little bit about um, the middle school's journey thus far from the adult perspective. Um, two summers ago, a team from the middle school attended the BEST Institute, um, focusing specifically on restorative practices. As I think many of you know, the BEST Institute has kind of a track for um, MTSS stuff and then a track for restorative practices stuff. Um, we went to the restorative side um, and we essentially came up with a three to five year implementation plan where we were attempting to do some um, kind of community building first. We, the, the, one of the main things we really got from John Kidda's presentation um, over the, the four days was that uh, building the community, building that tier one um, kind of part of the triangle uh, is foundational, obviously, um, to to being able to res to really build a restorative practice within a within a school community. So, um, some of the things that we had um, been uh, planning to focus on over the first few years was implementing an extended TA on Fridays um, to do restorative circles. We continue to do that this year. Um, there was a committee that met a, a committee of teachers and. Um, the plan was to include students this year. It's kind of fallen apart, to be perfectly frank. Um, uh, that was, they were meeting, um, we were meeting every week um, last school year, and um, the hope is to be able to kind of use some restorative conferencing, the tier two and tier three, um, within our discipline system. Um, I think that right now that is kind of where the plan stands. Um, I will just say, and we'll get to this a little bit later, that um, it becomes really difficult when it's when it's just like a couple, of, a few teachers or a few a few people really interested in this, and it's not kind of a, a systems wide um, approach. So we'll get to that then in a little bit. And, and I'm going to explain what we've been doing at the high school with restorative practices. So last year I had a half sabbatical because I had a Roland Fellowship and I was researching and learning all about how to bring more wellness practice and um, intentional focus on that for our students, both from a mental health perspective but also a community, social, relational perspective. And I came across through a workshop with John Kidda, restorative practices, knowing nothing about it. And that's how I learned about Lindsay and signed up for her class. Um, and the, the big emphasis in her class is it's youth-adult partnership, so that you're not doing two, but you're doing with. That's how these students got involved. Simultaneously, my colleague, Aaliyah Cohen, who couldn't be here tonight because she's not feeling well, but she also was getting in, interested and excited about this, and she went in a different direction. Um, we have since aligned our efforts, but what she was doing was she contacted a woman named Bianca who works for um, it's, a, it's a collaboration between DCF and Washington County Diversion Program, and they got a grant or something to go out to schools to educate them about how restorative practices work and what they are. And so Bianca came and she trained our faculty. She came three times, if I remember correctly, once just to give a broad overview, kind of like explaining this and what the different elements of restorative practices are. And then the next two times, she worked with faculty members who were particularly jazzed about the subject and trained us to lead circles. And so in two separate faculty meetings, two or three, I can't remember, um, we led circles with our faculty. And the, the first two were, the focus was on community building. The third one, we actually used circle discussion to uh, 
to deliberate about a pretty big question that we were all focused on. It had to do with cell phone use and what, were, what direction were we going to take with that within the high school. So that was our experience with circles last year. And that pretty much sums it up. So Lisa invited me and a couple other students to come to four full day conferences with Lindsay where we learned about restorative practices and youth adult partnerships and then presented to the NHS teachers at a morning meeting about the sort of practices and the circle and how we should implement them into our school. And then we met with the planning room about effective language, which is language that makes sure that when there is a conflict, it's not accusative tone, and no one feels like they are being attacked or accused. So that was a, um, the what? And now we want to talk about the why. So um, this is not, as you saw in that first slide that Mary Ann shared, um, that it's not an initiative or a program, and it's not like the next fad. Um, I think that this surge of interest nationally, globally, and in Vermont is in response to um, what we're seeing in schools and the needs of our young people in regards to social, emotional health, and well-being, and learning, and um, and quite frankly, the disciplinary um, data around um, suspensions and expulsions. <coughs> so um, Vermont actually, in 2016, um, passed H95, which asked the AOE to explore the use of restorative practices regarding school climate and culture, truancy, bullying, and harassment in school discipline. So it's been recommended to all schools, school districts, SUs, to consider an, a restorative approach before any kind of exclusionary discipline practice. With that, there's been a, a huge amount of um, learning and interest and collaboration in Vermont. Like I said, there's this Vermont Restorative Approaches Collaborative for supporting schools across the entire state um, that are looking at how to, ex that are exploring restorative practices and a restorative approach and then looking at implementation, which we know according to implementation science and lessons learned along the way, that it takes a good three to five years to truly be a restorative school. And to shift practices, it's practices and procedures, it's also curriculum and pedagogy and every level. So it's not just about discipline, it's about really exploring what it means to be a restorative um, school and environment. Um, and so this one really came out of this response to the zero, um, zero tolerance policies, which we know have not really helped, um, helped our young people at all. In fact, as um, Marianne will share in just a moment, created what I'm sure you've heard, the school to prison pipeline. Um, and so maybe that, that's all good. I'll turn it over to you now for your experience. Um, so last February, I got a chance to go attend a workshop with Lindsay. Um, it was in Holyoke, Massachusetts, and we got the chance to learn from the Palante Restorative Justice Program. And there, it's basically a youth-led program that was really awesome, and they had a lot of community support. And it was primarily made up of students of color, specifically like the Hispanic students who made up the majority of the school district. Um, it was also founded on youth power and youth voice, so it was completely youth-led. I'll reiterate that again and again. And it was really awesome to see that they had completely um, changed how the institution handles systemic discipline and had basically transformed and reformed the system altogether. And their school to prison pipeline system, like with suspensions and expulsions before this program became like full-on implemented, it was pretty high, and they managed to decrease the amount of students who get stuck in that um, cycling system. And it was really cool because these students um, are paid to be part of this program group, and they undergo extensive training, and they organize events like this where they um, uh, get a lot of people from all throughout northern states to come see and observe their workshops and how they are able to do this. So I thought that was pretty cool because it showed it wasn't just Vermont who was interested in this. It was also another state pretty close to us, Massachusetts, and it's also a national thing too. And I'll 
Well, and that's also the reasons why we should continue to start the practices and you know, pay more attention to it at our schools. It's because it would reduce hierarchy and would show respect for everyone and could be helpful with building relationships between students and students and students and teachers and make a more respectful environment and inclusive environment overall. Um, and then finally, just to give you a little more reason why we think it's a good idea, uh, restorative approaches have been linked in amongst other schools that are using them to, uh, and Marianne touched on this in her experience at Palante, but re reduce suspensions and expulsions, behavior referrals, uh, racial disparities and exclusionary discipline. It's been linked to teacher satisfaction and reduced turnover in their jobs. Um, students have identified increased academic performance and social emotional capacity, um, and that's a big focus in the district right now. Generally improved climate and culture, re reduced absenteeism and tardiness, and an overall parental satisfaction increase. Future direction. Um, so one of the things that this group discussed a lot in our course that we took last year together, um, as well as in our meetings this year, is just um, integrating our sort of practices into staff development district-wide. Something that we all feel really strongly about and kind of the research shows is that when an effort is made K-12, um, students know what to expect. They feel a part of the community from beginning to end. Um, if we if we can find a way to um, train staff in a really meaningful way, we also believe that they will feel a lot more comfortable in like really diving into this with students. Part of the the struggle right now, I think we've found, is that um, it's it's hard to put yourself out there and to feel a little bit vulnerable in these in these moments, um, and that's what's so important for, for adults to model how to do if we're, if we're expecting kids to be able to um, increase their kind of social emotional um, literacy. So, K-12, please. I just want to just like re-say, reiterate that I think the most important thing is having the students and the teachers together with this. Um, a biggest thing uh, was last year is, is that wasn't there. It was just something that they were doing to us. This needs to be something that is like a whole school Every person who steps in the doors each day needs to be a part of it. Um, and again, what Ali said, um, if the staff isn't on board with it, it's going to reflect back on the students' view of it, and that's really important. Also, we need to focus on Tier 1, which is building community and connections before we can move on to anything else, because having a good foundation is the most important part of this whole sort of practices. And so the point we really want to make sure it resonates with you is that this is not just some phase that the school is going through. This is something that will truly last and really believe will make the community a better place. And we welcome any questions you may have. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. That was excellent. Um, questions? Bridget? Um, a couple of you talked a little bit about your experiences at the middle school, but what's the experience like for students at the high school restorative practices? It sounds more like that the faculty is working on things. I was wondering what the students are experiencing. Um, do you want to answer that and then I can answer? Um, we don't really do a lot, <laughs> to be honest. We try to have sometimes in TM or something, but it's really, we don't have anything that's what's wrong. And I think in the planning room, it's more apparent, you know, Jen and Lucy Siri and Matt and I think they do a really, really good job of being caring and making sure that they are not just disciplining these kids, but as an overall community. There's not much going on that you need to change. I would agree with that and add that it's just in the infancy stages of we, the faculty, are just learning about it, and so we have not fully implemented it into the students' regular day. But that's why we're getting students involved to get their input on where they can imagine that happening. You know, I have my ideas, but I want to know where they think it would fit. So we're just getting started with that. I think there was one instance. I think there was 
one instance last year of a tier two circle that happened when there was a disciplinary issue in that health room. I don't remember the specifics, but it, what I'm trying to say is that it has existed here before, and I think that it could definitely take off easily. Reminded me of another thing. So earlier in the year, we were asked to address um, our students' PLP goals. So everybody has a TA on the faculty. And um, are you all familiar with what TA is? The teacher advisory group. Okay. So within TA, we were given a, an array of options of how we wanted to check in with our students about how they were the progress they were making toward their goals. And one of the options was you could do it as a circle. And um, different faculty members had different levels of comfort with that. And just anecdotally, in my TA, surprise, <laughs> we did a circle. And I will tell you the difference. We already had a pretty tight-knit TA, but the difference between the feel of my TA from the day before we did a circle to the day after, and even they commented on it, saying, like, wow, oh, that was really cool. And I wasn't so sure I wanted to share my goal with everybody, but I, I did, and it was fine. And it really was, um, it was a moving TA session, at least in my experience. Oh, and then the, the one to five years we shouldn't have Yeah, well, yeah, so, um, yeah, I think I had stated before that, of course, it takes time to completely change, you know, because uh, it is a paradigm change for, for a system. And I was thinking just from my own personal experience, I was um, an educator in Essex for 15 years, and um, we went through a whole school restorative approach, but it was very grassroots. And we know that when um, there's a few people that are really passionate about something and then those few people might leave to go elsewhere, what happens is it's not systemic. So you haven't really created that foundation. There's only pockets. And what I'm hearing and what I know from working with this team is that there's pockets because there are people that have interest in it. Um, what I would say is that, as Lissa stated that, or maybe it was Allie saying, what, what's next for the future is that it's really important that everyone has a foundation the what and the why, what are restorative. And, and once they realize that there's already so many things in their toolbox that, that, that are restorative, like so in our work we always start with like, well what are the strengths? What are the things that are already happening? Those are restorative approaches. But how are we gonna be more intentional about making sure that happens, not just in TA, but that is a place to do it, sitting in a circle. But, but how are we gonna look at curriculum choices? Like where do youth have a voice in the, in, their curriculum, in their learning, in school discipline approaches. Um, it has to be done in partnership and with the youth at the table. Um, and all people need to be involved in the work. So I've done a lot of trainings this year with, um, which is not really um, the work of our organization up for learning is youth adult partnership. But I have done some work with some schools that are whole, every adult that works in that system being um, trained in what it is and why. So that's at the, everyone from the cafeteria staff to the custodial staff to the administrative staff to teaching staff to support staff coming together. It really needs to be systemic and then it does take time. So we always look at year one as an, as an exploration year of really getting our feet wet, learning about it, digging in a little bit, trying things out. And then the next couple of years are around like partial implementation and then really three to five, like any change can occur in an organization, it takes a good three to five years. So um, it does take time and it, um, I think it's a worthwhile investment. I know it's a worthwhile investment. I've seen the success in many places. Um, there, there's schools that are close by. There's many schools in Vermont that are um, digging into this work um, all over the state and then nationally as well. But it does take time and it, and it really does take buy-in. I mean, that's a, that's a huge piece of it is that there needs to be buy-in and to build capacity. I just wanted to give a couple more things um, that are happening at the Main Street Middle School. Um, there are a number of teachers who do feel really um, interested and invested in this kind of um, way of being as an educator. And so um, a good number of teachers have used circles um, in academic settings. I think it's really important to note that um, the idea of student voice, obviously, we know can be used in more places than just disciplinary settings or community building settings. 
So academic circles are something that a lot of teachers use. I know that Lindsay used them when she was a teacher. Um, there have been teachers from five to eight in the Main Street Middle School who use them um, as like reflective kind of exercises um, after a unit, um, a, a warm up during a unit. Um, there's, there's a number of academic ways to use them. Um, I can tell you that just as a social worker, shock of shocks, I've used a lot of circles in my work. Um, but also there have been a, a few kind of bigger um, kind of group harm situations that have occurred in the middle school and we've come together in, in this circle to, to kind of address it. And the feedback I get from students is that that's the first time that anyone's like asked me to share with a group of people how I felt after something terrible happened to me. Um, rather than just sharing it with the assistant principal or with the teacher or you know with one person with one adult, um, being students being heard when they've been harmed is incredibly empowering. Um, the other thing that I'll just mention quickly is that um, I uh, kind of put together and helped to facilitate this countywide restorative practices um, PLC, so pers um, professional learning community. Um, so it's district-wide, so we have a number, we've got like five or six schools that come together once a month and we discuss kind of like um, where we are in the journey and we problem solve together. So there are a number of schools in, in Washington County and all over Vermont, but specifically in Washington County who are really working hard towards this and I think we have a, a much larger community um, that we can draw from and learn from. I have a question. First of all, thank you all. Really dynamic and effective and collaborative way to convey a message. Very powerful. Um, question is for you, Libby. So, not to put you on the spot, but to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, so, are there any plans in place at the administrative level to help facilitate the expansion of these practices? Yeah. So, um, Mary touched on it when she presented to you all, what, a month ago? Two board meetings ago? in the sense of we have to get our ducks in a row first um, in terms of we need a SEL district-wide group so we came together as an administrative team just last week to put together who we want on that team. Um, and principals are now touching people's shoulders to say, hey, you're gonna be on this, this these that we have meeting dates set and that kind of thing, now we're gathering the team run by Mary. That, that team will be responsible for coming up with a common data system, coming up with a common understanding of what we mean when we say STL learning, common understanding of what our K-12 vertical articulated curriculum is around that, um, and then working towards, this is the recommendation we're making district-wide for the work to be done. Um, so we have, some, we have some pieces to put in place prior to uh, jumping whole hog. I think the Alyssa and Allie and certainly Lindsay from her statewide perspective hit on how that we have we have some adults in our system who are interested in this work. We do not have all adults who are interested in this work. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do around what is it that we truly need? Um, what does tier one look like? What are we expecting all kids to know and be able to do? Um, prior to some of this, which connects to exactly what Lindsay was saying. You know, if she says, what are you doing now? That's, that's restorative work, it's just um, naming it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks. Good night, thank you. Thank you. Drive safe. Yeah, drive safe. Yes. Yes. <laughs> no, students <laughs> and adults. I don't think so. I don't think so, I think we're using it. No, I don't think he is, he just has copies. <laughs> Did you already uh, present? No. Did this consume a bunch of time? So we have with you, with us tonight, two, two student representatives who are going to be with us for the rest of the school year. You all know Hope, who just got into Columbia. <coughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's like deja vu all over again. I know. <laughs> Um, I just heard that. <laughs> yeah, I did get into Columbia. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Have a seat you have like at a Columbia, Columbia seat on the board. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And we'd like to welcome Eve Taylor. Um, and Eve is a junior at Montclair High School. And so the idea we wanted to try to get at the beginning, but um, Ms. Hope is a little busy, is to have a senior and a junior on the board. So then the senior can mentor the junior, and then the junior can mentor the senior. Um, 
or is it switching up next year? You know what I mean? Uh, yes. So I'm not sure. Did you all plan something to, to talk about, or we met the other day, but I wasn't sure. Okay, yeah. go for it. Um, so I understand that the consent agenda and public comment and first part of learning focus is taken up some time, so I don't want to take up much more time. Um, but we do have a pretty short, just uh, structure student celebrations and then student concerns needs and perspectives so it's similar to last year um, and then in terms of student celebrations which is what we'll start off with uh, the marking period has just begun but we're about to go off for break and so there's sort of a little bit of a lull and some seniors me are hearing back about college um, <laughs> some are applying and the juniors are prepping for second semester junior year which is uh, a, a busy time with standardized testing and AP, AP, AP classes in general. Um, so that's happening. And in preparation for winter holiday break, student council's holding an ugly sweater contest this Friday. Uh, winter sports have started. Uh, yeah, so Greece auditions have happened for our spring musical, and it's one of the largest ensembles that the mask theater program has had in the high school, so it's great to see that more students are getting interested in being involved in the arts program. Um, Club Interact is holding a toy joy drive in order to get more connected with the community. It's basically just we have shoe boxes and we're filling it with items for Heat and Woods, Westview Meadows, and families involved with the Meals on Wheels program. And yeah, do you want to talk about the concerns? Yeah, um, so just to add on to celebrations, um, Winter Ball just happened and that raises money for Project Grad. Uh, the French class is fundraising for their uh, spring uh, trip to Montreal and Quebec, and they did so by selling, making and selling crepes at the Garage Cultural Center, which is this new cool spot in town, and uh, other MHS faculty and staff were part of the, um, I think it was centered around bees, there was this kind of craft fair, yeah. so it was a whole community effort. Uh, and then the middle school play just happened, and as we've heard from uh, some parents, it was a huge success. Uh, and then in terms of student concerns and needs and student perspectives, this continues from last year, just the idea of like what are the what are our continued efforts to support diversity and inclusion in MRPS school MRPS schools. Um, and I think that it relates to what we've heard tonight about restorative practices and that's something that Emma and I bumped a lot last year, just in terms of uh, knowing that we already have some tenets of restorative practices in our community already and I think that's what makes it so dynamic and special and I think that as, as a relatively smaller set of schools we have the privilege of having the opportunity to have a sense of community that large schools especially in big cities don't necessarily have and it's an opportunity that we can make the most of and part of the reason why restorative practices haven't been as developed in the high school is because when um, when presenting a sort of initiative that changes the way that schools work and changes the way that relationships are formed and held between students and teachers it's often good to get first good first impressions otherwise community members will sort of withdraw and then not want to re-engage. So I think that it's, it's especially in other communities, like U32's tried it, and what's, what experience has shown is that spending time developing and working on tiers for the first year and the second year and the third year and so on and so forth is really, really pivotal to ensuring that restorative practices are successful. But I think that like part of what has helped me feel so dedicated to my community and part of like why I serve on the board and why I'm so involved in the community is because I feel, I, I just feel connected to it essentially. Um, and I think that, that that restorative practices can help ensure that more students feel connected to their school environments because we spend like six hours a day here and some less, some more, but we spend a huge amount of our time at school and so a huge, it's a huge part of our lives and so it would it would be a really positive force if students felt even more connected and even more happy here and 
didn't view their teachers just as authority figures or distant people trying to like impose something on them, but as as um, friends and confidants and um, supporters. And um, let's see. With the equity policy and the equity specialist and the district-wide equity com committee, I am a member of the Racial Justice Alliance and we are happy that there's an open position for a student member on that committee just because it's it's important to get student voice in all, all areas of decision making and it'll help make better policy and I think especially with something like equity it's really important to hear student perspectives. So, it's, it's also just a chance to uphold a sense of transparency with students and the student body about what the committee is working on and how the policy is being implemented. And um, Earth Group is in the process of meeting with administration and I know they're going to be in touch with the school board and Libby in the coming weeks, especially after we get back from break, uh, for this project that I can say we because I'm part of Earth Group, um, that we've developed and it is the idea of a food forest in the mud lot because something that, it, it's basically an initiative to mitigate storm water runoff into the Winooski, which is a problem and it's already a problem because of agriculture um, near the river and near the river valley and it would be basically um, shrubbery and berry bushes and fruit and nut trees as well as a place for students to hang out there would be pathways and benches and there's also obviously the concern about keeping the fire lane open and obviously we would that would be in the design of it but it's essentially to make sure that um, stormwater runoff doesn't go into the Winooski River along with um, a lot of the um, like I don't know how to explain it but like from cars and a lot of the like debris and pollution and litter doesn't go into the river and also just a chance to have a beautiful space for students and a chance to grow food for the cafeteria. So I know that students are meeting with Renee DeVore and they're going to hope to present to the school board in the next few weeks about it. That's pretty much it, um, but we're here to answer questions you may have and obviously in um, the next few months about proficiency-based learning and behavior and class sizes and anything like that. So we're here. We're here for you. Yeah. We're glad you're back. Yeah. No, thanks, Open so We're excited, yeah. to, excited to have you for the rest of the year. Thank you. So we appreciate the commitment, too. Questions for Open Great. Thanks. Thanks. Budget. <laughs> Fun stuff. Well, this might actually have a chance to get you right back on schedule because there's not much to give you an update on. Like um, that. <laughs> it's good and bad news. If you could just take one and pass them to the middle, please. So um, instead of showing slides, I just wanted to put something together real quick to serve as a quick update. The first bullet talks about follow-up items. So at the last budget presentation, um, I was asked to compare actual tax rates to the tax rates that we showed during town or informational hearings to see what the differences are. And I was also asked to uh, look at the enrollment projection for FY20 versus what the enrollment actually was for FY20. So if you turn to the second page, that's the follow-up piece. So that first section is talking about I didn't leave Roxbury off for any other reason other than there was no change between the tax rate that was presented on information hearing and the vote because of the 5% limitation. So I just focused on, on Montpelier. So what you see is last year, the actual tax rate was actually about 0.3 cents higher than the informational hearing. But that was an anomaly. The year before that, the voters basically passed a budget that was six and a half cents higher in a tax rate than what the actual tax rate ended up at. The year before that, it was 4.7 cents higher than what the actual rate was. So that's just a little bit of a snapshot of how things go because there's a, a commission, tax commissioner recommendation on things like dollar yield early in the process 
And by the time everything sugars off and the legislature sets the, the dollar yield, it can be dramatically different. Um, then the enrollment projection versus actuals. So you can see that um, going the columns across K through 12, and then the projection, what it was, the actual enrollment, the difference, and then I did the difference by grade cluster. And so what jumped out at me, obviously, was the kindergarten number being so dramatically off. And then I realized what, I went back to the formulas and realized it was pulling from four years ago's birth data instead of five years ago. If I had done it correctly, that number would have been 66 instead of 88. Huge difference in birth data from one year to the next. Um, the other thing that jumps out is grade 12. Looks like that was off dramatically. But as I looked at the formulas there, for the past at least four years, we've dropped kids from 11th to 12th grade every year. If there were 80 kids the next year in, in 11th grade, the next year they'd only be 76 in 12th grade. Not sure what that out migration is, but we usually drop kids from 11th to 12th. This past year, we actually picked up six. So instead of a typical loss of six or seven, we picked up six. So that's why that was there. So the kind of good news is the only place I found any kind of error in the formula was in kindergarten. So if you turn the page again, this is the new enrollment projection slide. So you can compare this to the budget presentation on the fourth to see the difference. What you really see is in the 2021 column for kindergarten, that number was 73, now it's 71. And then you'll see that kind of water flow, waterfall down in FY21-22. It's kindergarten and first that's a little bit different. And then it's kindergarten first second, kindergarten first second third. So those first, that first kind of triangle in the upper right hand corner are the numbers that are a little bit lower on this chart than they were. The bottom line totals, we still are seeing increasing enrollment all the way through 22-23, but it's just not as high. Like the number I think used to be in 22-23, in the total K-12 I think was 11.65, now it's 11.50. So it's not as high, but it is still increasing. So that slide will now be part of the budget presentation, this updated enrollment slide. But if you go back to the first page now, um, changes since December 4th. What I usually tell you is anything that I changed in the budget from one budget presentation to the next, there's not a lot. Tax factors, the only thing we know now is the, the non-residential uh, base rate. And that's got to still be set by law, but at least we have a good guess. Um, we do have the dollar yield recommendation, but I'm not using it yet because of that, that swing that we sometimes see through the legislative process. Enrollment projections, obviously I changed those and we just talked about that. No changes on revenues, no significant changes in revenues, but on the expense side, you'll see there it's highlighted there was a zero dollar net change. There were several places where I could collect in some savings but um, Mary Lundeen let Libby and I know that she's now got some new information about some kids that are coming into district that we're going to have to worry about for potential outside placement costs. So instead of reducing the budget, I put that money in the last line for special ed outside placements to make sure that we don't end up with a deficit. I also had to cover the lacrosse coach that we added. And then personnel changes, it's hard to explain this, but um, this year, if we had somebody shift positions, it may have led to a difference in what I budgeted for what they come in at. Like, for example, bless you, if I had a custodian that was part-time that's now filling a full-time job, I may have budgeted less money for that full-time job, and now I'm having to pay that higher rate. So because of a few changes like that in personnel, um, uh, in FY20, that kind of pushes over into FY21. So I had to create a little bit of extra money there. A through E are just places where I was able to reduce the budget some. The school resource officer, as you know, we have a new one. So there's a new higher savings, in essence, that gets passed along to us from the city. Dental vision, I had assumed that we were gonna have a small rate increase for dental vision. It turns out both rates are level. So um, unlike health, 
both rates were level. So whenever I rolled that in, we had a little bit of savings there. Statewide health negotiations, I know in some districts it's a big expense for us. Whenever we actually roll it in, it, it actually is a reduction from what we had originally budgeted. Uh, Grandparented tuition for Roxbury um, high school students. I had a placeholder for about a half of a student in case we had like somebody who was a tech student switch from tech to uh, regular high school because then I would have to pay regular high school tuition. But we just don't have the flexibility to budget for a bunch of um, contingencies. So I just took that out. Um, high school testing materials, this was actually kind of an oversight on my part. We increased that to allow for AP tests to be paid for by the district. We intended for that only to be for us to pay for AP tests for kids on free and reduced lunch because we don't have a high percentage of FRO kids taking these tests. So this was kind of a, to help alleviate that. That amount of money is way less than if we were paying for all AP tests. So that's why that reduction is there. So there's a reduction of about $52,000, but I realigned it into those other areas for now. Um, the next section, still unknowns, equalized pupil count. We did get a first draft of equalized pupils, but our numbers are definitely not right. So we still are on hold for that. Um, common level of appraisal, I think Libby mentioned last year we got it December 24th. I haven't seen it yet, but it should be soon. Um, special ed revenues should be out, should have been out on the 15th, I still haven't seen them. But those are big things that hopefully we'll get between now and, and January 8th when we have a full-fledged full, um, full -fledged budget update. So I guess my question is, as I learn some of these unknowns and roll them in, my question to the board is listed under discussion. Do you have any kind of target you want me to try to hit or you want us to try to hit? Right now, spending per pupil is an increase of 4.36%. Um, our education spending is an increase of 4.77 now, I think. Um, the residential tax rate for Montpelier is going up 5.34%, which is 8.8 .8 cents, I think. So if there's any of these, those kinds of, uh, any targets that you have in mind for any of those areas, I can try to keep that in mind. I won't promise because if, if the factors go the wrong direction, there's just no way to be able to hit them. But if, you're, if there is an idea that, hey, we want spending per pupil only be an increase of 4%, something like that, then we can keep that in mind whenever we crunch through it between now and January 8th. Any thoughts? My general thought is that these outstanding items are really very large unknowns that could sway things pretty drastically one way or another. And I feel like if my own, this is just me speaking, the way that I see it is if we make a decision now and then it swings in a positive direction um, and we've made you know a decision we're trying to stick to a, a certain line, it's kind of arbitrary at that point. Whereas when we have more information and we know what the liability will look like for Montpelier taxpayers, I feel like we'll be able to make more informed decisions. We know what's being added and I don't think, you know, we necessarily will need. Well, I mean, unfortunately we're kind of persistently in this position of, you know, these three big factors from the state. Um, don't come in in time. So, um, you know, How? We're, we're, generally, we're generally stuck with a situation where we have to make guesstimates, and, you know, Grant, I think, does a very good job of being conservative on those estimates so that we don't have, I, we've generally been surprised not too wildly and, and more often than not positively. So Michelle? The um, AOE in the St by statute is required to give us the equalized pupil number by December 1st. I believe it is December 1st, yeah. And that hasn't been happening. Um, no, but they would be quick to say, there's there's fingers pointing every direction here. Yeah. Um, it's in, last year was the first year with that new Vermont statewide data management system, SDDMS or something like that. SLDS. SLDS, oh, mine is SSD. SLDS. 
Um, so there was a lot of problems with the AOE being able to get data from all the districts and supervisory unions. So we would say it's because the system was bad. AOE would say it's because we didn't get the data in time. I would say that same argument pertains this year. Um, we would still say there's problems with the system that makes it very difficult to get our information in. But the AOE would say we can't give you data unless we have your data. So we're still in the same place we were last and year. What's the AOE doing to fix it? Um, we'll As talk Secretary about that off, off camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, hey then. I ask because you may remember that I'm now representing our region on the BSBA board, mm -hmm. and someone from a different district has raised this complaint, and so I'm. We're sort of weighing how. I am there with you, Michelle. This year, um, let me try to say this in a good way. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, this year is not necessarily the AOE's fault from our perspective. In other districts, yes, it is. I'm blaming the AOE. <laughs> um, but we, we this, were, we, Montpelier Roxbury was not speaking. Because of a change in the data management position and because of um, some decisions that were made prior to um, the new data management and technology director being in their position mm -hmm. that was unbeknownst to us, um, we, our power school wasn't updated. And because of, and when we tried, our new data manager, when he tried to update it, it would look like it was updated and then it would revert back to like Power School 3. Hmm. Um, and because it had been told to do that by former employees. So um, we couldn't figure out why. Um, so we've hired. So we had our own technology problems. Yes. yes. So we hired an outside consultant to fix that for us. However, he just uncovered this because it was so deep in Power School. Um, and so we, he is, we're paying a lot of money for him to fix our system. Um, and so this one is on us. But yes, the uh, rollout was awful. No, there's not a lot of support at the AOE for this rollout. The other system kind of stakes. However, this one's on us completely. So we're in a little bit of a weird predicament around that right now. <laughs> yeah, but Fed revenues, I think, are supposed to also be provided by, I don't know if it's statutory, but by December 15th. I know that. One of the reasons why you weren't voting on um, announced tuition is because one of the factors I use is the allowable tuition from last year to, to kind of gauge where we are. We don't have the allowable tuition from last year yet. Once again, that should that is by statute. I think that we're supposed to have that um, by now. And that would be another one where people are pointing in both directions. I'm pointing at the AOE because my data is in. Why can't I get my, uh, my allowable tuition? The AOE is pointing back saying, yeah, well, yours is, but not everybody else's it is, and so we can't crunch the numbers. So there's a few things like that. Um, but yeah, I would say last year the, the equalized pupil thing was probably more on them. This year it's probably more on us. Specifically us, not, yeah. not school, not districts in general. Right. There's a few that have issues, but we're in the minority then. Okay. <clears throat> I've got no problem with you know not having a target. I just wanted to make sure that I was sensitive to that if you had one. I know that this year it is a big ask. I mean, there are positions that aren't that aren't nice to have, they're must-haves. You know, classroom teacher at the middle school, we have to based on the class sizes. The fact that we don't have a behavior person at the middle school, we have to do that. There's lots of things we'd love to do. But there are unfortunately a lot of things that we have to do, which is already putting us at a higher rate of increase than we typically have. So. Anyway, anything else? No. Tina's first. No, Tina. I was just going to say, well, you know that I might say I certainly don't want it to go up, but I'm with Andrew that I don't, I don't know how you could say anything yet. Too much unknown. Yeah. You know, I thought that, that the first presentation in the budget was, was excellent and we had we had a good discussion of the things that we would really love to have and are not in the budget. So it's clear that the budget that you presented was designed to address 
address really significant needs in the district and in fact is not addressing everything that we could probably address. So I certainly don't. I'm certainly not suggesting that anyone would go back and try to cut the budget at this point. I think we just have to wait and see how the numbers come out. Okay. Well, January 8th, hopefully we have all the pieces we need to be able to make some good decisions there. I forget the date when we need to have everything finalized by. What's that? When do we have to have everything finalized by for, for the voters? Um, so in January. Yeah, it's like the 24th. It's, yeah, it's late January. Yeah, there's 24. like a 30 day window and I, I didn't. Well, it's the before the city council meeting, the second city council meeting in January. Is that still the case, or are we so separate from them now that we're it's not separate? Separate. Well, we we're have separate. Our, with our, our work plan is that the next meeting is the public forum. So Grant will do a larger presentation. Then the fifteenth is I have budget approval in our work plan. So is there a the window there on when it has to be published? Uh, yeah, actually, I think you may have put that in there, Grant. <laughs> budget info meeting parentheses. This needs to be done. Or this needs to be before town meeting day on 3 3 20, probably 3 2. Okay. So that's, oh, that's not when it's fun. No, you have to get it in the book. You yeah. have to get on the No, way. you don't have that in here. I don't have it. Okay. There is a, there is a, a window of time that the um, annual reports have to be out. Yeah. And I know that Montpelier's already and asked me about hey, do you have your audit report for us to put the segment in there about the audit? So I, I can get back to you on what okay. what that period is, but it's it's not as so much a period for us because we're dependent on Roxbury having our articles in there, uh, in amongst their articles and our information being in the Montpelier annual report. So we're hitting their windows within that window, but um, I can send you something on what that window of time is. It could be helpful for us if we have are faced with difficult decisions. And Michelle's right, it's a good question. I don't think we need to need is it, to report to the city, but whether we did it last year. Yeah, yeah, we did last year. So it's just a matter of getting it before the book's published. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, we get our articles to them so that they can right. put it in there and have the vote and everything, but yeah, it will be just our own information here. Thanks for all your work on this. Yeah, any other questions for Grant? Great. Great. Thank you. Have a good night. Be safe. Thanks, Thanks Grant. Drive safe. Superintendent Buzz. So, um, is the RSV support staff a dead coordinator? Is that oh, um, RVS support staff strike that from the agenda. I did not get the information I needed from the building leader there, so we're going to strike that for right now. It may come back on a different agenda. The MHS data coordinator position, you saw that in the budget for next year. It's the 0.5 position for guidance support. Um, in talking to the guidance department and Renee here, um, they have asked if we could put that into the budget now from fund balance because of the SLDS challenges that the person who is doing that role is focusing solely on state data-wide systems and the guidance team needs somebody helping them with scheduling. Um, and needs to learn that process from somebody who knows how to do it, um, which Matt could help with that. Um, so they've asked if we could put that into the budget now, so that or we could have money for it now for the remainder of the school year, so they could get somebody in place, train them through the spring and scheduling for next year. Um, or that's going to be a huge task that I'm not positive right now who would do it and who has the knowledge base to do it. So if we got them in early, Matt could take some of his time. To, train, to help train somebody in power school and how to do that piece. Um, and then that person could do the scheduling for the following year for our students. On the nuts and bolts front, do we have any idea what the cost of that is and what what that is in relation to the fund balance at present? I believe it's like fifteen to $20,000. And Grant, Grant is well aware. I should have had him stay. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's well aware of this and is, is believes we have the fund balance to, to do that. Right. Are we looking to hire a new person, or is this filling, having another person who's currently on staff take no, on this task? It's to hire a new person, to yes. hire the 0.5 early, essentially, okay. that is in next year's budget. Okay. So are we planning to vote on that next time, or when, when are we, what's the plan for that? Um, 
the budget as a whole. Five. Well, we don't we don't have an amount, so we can't yeah. approve the fund balance transfer. Yeah, no, we can't do it right now. We need more information. <laughs> Great, come back. Do that. You go run a haircut. <laughs> Sorry. You might, as you're running, tell them we need that number. Yeah. <laughs> well, a couple numbers. Uh, yeah. We can do the super bad supervision evaluation. Oh, there's green. Oh, he's just telling me the window to post the budget warning is January 23rd for February 2nd. Yeah. Come back. Wait, did you say it's January 23rd to February 2nd? Yes. So okay, so, so February 2nd is when we have until... Yes, Okay. but the municipalities are usually looking for our info at the beginning of the period. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. We get everything printed and <laughs> every other town is asking the printer to get their stuff printed. Actually, I think it's interesting thing that I learned from other school districts is that they finalize their contracts prior to finalizing their budget. Such pressure, Michelle. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of such a thing, but other people are really stressed about it. So. Do we want to do that? No, I just told them what we need. All right. Um, so, yeah, let's go to the superintendent evaluation, and we'll, we'll have to uh, interrupt that program yeah. for a second. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I don't really have a presentation for you around the mid-year progress update. I put it. I put it together and give you a chance to ask any questions you want to ask. Um, I'm open to anything. Questions about the superintendent evaluation. I have well, I have a question, but I have a comment. My first comment is I love the learning focuses. So I learn something every time. Okay. <laughs> so thank you for that. I think it's a good, good part of the budget, and I think it's. I've always thought it's part of the superintendent's job to educate for. Good job. Um, And my other thing has to do with um, next steps. I was trying to figure out what section this is in. Community public relations section. And I was looking at your next steps. And um, looking at two to say, yep, I'm concerned too about how you get people here. But I think it's important to do. So I don't know what the rest of the board thinks about that. And we've talked before about how do we develop a gauge for what parents are. I don't have an answer. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I would do it five months late. I think that might be really discouraging. Right. Yeah. Yeah. To you, Did given the attendance. Did your mentor suggest that strategy? Were there other superintendents doing that, or was that just an idea that no, kind of? idea. We, we did have a series called Soup with the Super, and um, I think it might have been monthly. And parents could come in and with the superintendent. And I went to one, and I was one of two parents. And I'm on the board, so I don't know. <laughs> 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 um, well, part of what I was thinking is sometimes principals have like principal teas that were something, yeah. the same thing, super the principal, to get people in. And I know it always takes time. It's a build up. It's like you have to persist. Yeah. But I agree not by monthly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And principals have a different end. There's a different desire for a parent to see a principal than see a superintendent. Yes. But even that's hard for principals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I that's why I was saying it would take yeah. I think working at it. Yeah. Food's always good. Pizza with a number. She was texting. Pizza. The healthy events at Bar Hill. Yeah. 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 So far, every event I have been there. <laughs> I used to work for them, so I got an in. I'm afraid I get some some uh, feedback. Thank you. <laughs> some feedback around um, alcohol and education. <laughs> oh, that's possible. <laughs> yes. 
So the grant estimated 60% for the rest of the school year, which is that 10 5 you see. Okay, so he's, he's, so going back to the previous conversation, it would be 10,500, about 10,500 from our fund balance for the um, part-time guidance data support. Which is 60% of the salary department. I'm sorry. Which is 60% of the Oh, okay. It's going to say. Sorry, Grant. <laughs> we almost let you go. And Grant, our current fund balance is what? <laughs> I think I have it. No, I think, I think I have one of our last ones. I'm thinking it was like just about 1.1, 1 .1, between 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2 million. Yeah, yeah, like 4.95% of the budget right now. So we can finally handle this. We can I move that we approve fund balance expenditure of $10,500. Higher the 0.1 million in the fund balance. Yeah. Yeah. To staff the guidance department. Do you have second that? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great. Yeah, so we won't commit the money, like officially committing it, like it'll come back before, but we'll just use fund balance to cover as we can move over. Thanks, Grant. Thank you, Grant. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could I have thought of this trick? It's a fun trick. It is an excellent book. <laughs> <laughs> it's an excellent book. I highly recommend it. I'm sure I will. Thank you, Bob. Anybody who's busy. Great. Okay. Thanks, Evan Eve. Nope. And I don't know if this girl will actually. Thank you. And how do you have the system for your email inbox? It's through, it's through the, I have like 800 things in my inbox. Oh. It's the book. David Allen. <laughs> right now, my inbox has like 15 things in it and it's stressing me out. So it's like it's like totally changed my inbox productivity. First of all, my task is and the way Anna and I work together. You need to consolidate. I'm seeing. I'm telling you, but you need the book. The book is life changing. Which, which, which book do you rely on? This one, the five, the five. choices for extraordinary uh, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I use David Allen getting things done. His. Uh, oh, I, I have that one too. Yeah. <laughs> I have that one too. His email system has helped me. Well, maybe that's a good thing to just ask you to comment on because it's one of the hardest things to do. Is it is so one, of the, so one of the big changes I, I made this year is moving things to a task list in my calendar. So when you have those like 15, you know, oftentimes things don't work out exactly. You know, you finish a task and you have like 15 minutes before a meeting and you don't, you know, like you have that time. And so it's, it's either go on Facebook, mm -hmm. right? Or it, it drives me straight to what's, the, what's on the task list that I can accomplish in this period of time. Right, and so it helps me check things off where it's like, even if it's just something I need to read that the AOE sent out, I put it on my task list and then I know, you know, like, so my task list is a whole lot longer than it used to be, but that's okay because I know that there are things I'm going to accomplish when I have the snippets of time to do it. Um, like today, the, the IA or the support staff meeting got canceled from three to four. So it was immediate. <laughs> now I can immediately say, what's on my task list to get, because I have an hour now, right? that I can accomplish. So it, that that has definitely changed. I've color coded my calendar, although I was better at the beginning than I am now. So Anna knows that, and she's, she's getting better too, but she knows me more. When somebody comes in and says, does Libby have a free moment today and I have a booked calendar, she knows that some of it is like prep time. It's board meeting prep or it's, you know, it's prep time built in there. And she knows like, yeah, she can probably take 15 minutes from that piece um, based on colors and, and just what, what it says in my calendar, so it helps her help me <laughs> be more productive, which is good. Anyway, it's been a great, it's been a different, it's been definitely a change for me this year. So I guess since it's on here, I'll go back and ask about public relations to say, I've heard nothing. I think that's a good thing. I wonder what the rest of the board is about. I mean, the main thing I've heard about is the gym as of late from a certain individual. More than him. There's a number of, of uh, certain individuals. Oh, use of the gym? There's, there's, a, there's, a, yeah, there's, there's a group that's more than, yeah. <laughs> and they have been calling or when I run into them places, like talking with me about it. They're people I know. So, 
I mean, I feel like that's a budget issue and that's a board issue, and not, it's not really a superintendent issue. I mean, we could put as much money in the budget that we wanted to. No, no, I'm talking about- To have the gym be open, but oh. we didn't. We didn't. Well, also, when, when people complained about the gym last year, the, the schedule was unreal. If you've ever looked, gone in and met with Tracy and looked at the schedule, Everything is like super duper scheduled, cross scheduled, over scheduled. Yeah, it's it's basically I, Tracy's full time job right now. Managing mm -hmm. all of our facilities, mm -hmm. yeah, and all of the community groups that are trying to reserve the facilities. Yeah, Anna could probably speak to that because I don't want to put you on the spot, but she Tracy was just on vacation and Anna took a, took that over, so she had for that week. Yeah, but she's working with the school admins. All the schools' calendars are organized a little bit differently. It's gyms, it's classrooms, it's many, many calendars, multiple people within our district coming in and asking for time, and then the community too. And they're it's all booked all the time. They are, they're completely booked. It's a lot of shuffle for our own staff. Every, you know, every day we're coming in and asking Tracy in person because it's that much of a shuffle daily. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Libby. Thank this you. is super thorough and um, very informative. Um, I think we are executive session time. We want to wait, wait. More item I'll agenda. make a motion to accept this. Uh, we need to super oh, that's right. Here I took it off the consent agenda. Thank you. Second. Second. Favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed. Remind me of that. Um, Executive session, and we want to have one more item of the executive session to figure out what the exact wording was. Uh, let's discussion of public official official place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we'd have to, in addition to contract negotiations, we need a little thingy for contract negotiations, as we all know. Um, also, add uh, discussion of evaluation of a public. Um. That doesn't need a finding, right? No. Okay. So we move that we find that discussing contract negotiations in open session would put the board at a substantial disadvantage. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And then a motion to move into executive session for those two purposes. So the two purposes being contract negotiations and evaluation of both of them. Yes. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye